Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the webinar. We've got two great speakers um, for you today. And um, I'll be introducing them both in just a second. Um, we're dealing with a very, very important issue, I think, for all of us um, in these very troubled times. Um, and the title of the webinar is Creating Indispensable Partner Relationships in a Time of Uncertainty. So before I introduce the speakers, just want to run through a couple of housekeeping issues. So firstly, um, we'll be taking questions um, at the end of the session, and there are two ways you can ask a question. The first is if you want to ask the question um, live, um, click the button that will raise your hand. We know, will then know that you've asked a question, uh, we will then unmute you and you will be able to ask a question verbally. Um, the other way to ask a question is to use the questions panel and simply type your question into that panel um, and I will then um, raise those questions uh, or unmute you if you've raised your hand with the panelists at the end of the session. So just a couple of things um, that are happening future-wise. So if we move on to the next slide. So we have two great webinars coming up, one on May the 14th, talking about um, as social distancing begins to ease, um, how do you reopen your channel marketing programs? And then on June the 23rd, uh, really good, um, panel of speakers talking about um, how you gain partner mind share. So put those in your diaries as well. So without further ado, let me introduce our two speakers today. And Dan, if we could move on. Okay. So uh, our first speaker is Kerry Desberg. Um, she's with Impartner and she joined Impartner in 2015. She's from Seattle in Washington, so obviously has been bearing the brunt of this, as indeed has Dan. She has more than 30 years experience across the business to business and business to consumer marketing and, co and communication spectrum. She's worked with some of the world's top corporations and agencies, and they include companies like Procter & Gamble, Owens Corning, Danaher and Lockheed Martin, and agencies such as Fleishman Hilliard. And she is, she tells me, the ultimate foodie, um, both in terms of going out to restaurants and cooking herself. So at the moment, she's obviously very much focusing on the latter. And she was telling me that she, like me, has numerous very ratty cookbooks um, around the kitchen that she's been using for a, a number of years. So our second speaker is Dan Overgag. And Dan is managing director for the Spur Group. He leads the firm's channel management, sales transformation, and business operations practices. And he has over 12 years industry experience. At Spur, Dan has led countless strategic initiatives for large technology firms, where he's advised them on channel management programs, channel incentives, and helped them drive efficiencies and develop program and portfolio management structures within their business operations. Dan loves the Pacific Northwest and taking advantage of the wide variety of outdoor activities available. Um, but recently, he's been spending time in quarantine, like all of us, working in the yard. So um, all of that beauty you can see in the background behind Dan um, is no doubt courtesy of all the work he's been putting in recently uh, and keeping the kids from destroying the house, which no doubt he'll tell us all about later. Um, but without um, further ado, Dan, I'd like to hand over to you. Yeah, thank you, Rod, for that introduction, and uh, you thank you, everyone, for attending today. Uh, again, my name is Dan Overgag, and I'm a managing director at the Spur Group. And one of my primary functions there is leading our channel management and our business operations practices. Also on the phone is Richard Flynn, who's our chief marketing officer at Spur, and another one of our channel gurus. And he'll be on throughout the presentation and also available at the end to answer any questions that you might have. So as Ron mentioned, you know, this webinar is focused on creating indispensable partner relationships in a time of uncertainty. 
and how that new balance of both human and digital interaction will power the most successful channels in the future. So before I begin, you know, let me provide a brief overview about you know, what you can expect today and from this webinar. So for myself, you know, I'm gonna cover what we call the partner value proposition and then highlight a change in what we're seeing in today's partner value prop, then focus on why that change is particularly important today. And then finally, how you set yourself up as a vendor for success in these changing times. Um, and then, you know, as Rod mentioned, I'm gonna turn it over to Carrie and she's got uh, a number of things that she's gonna walk through from in partner side. And finally, down at, the, uh, down at the bottom of the slide there, you know, we've listed out some of the key takeaways that we hope you'll leave this webinar with. So the first thing I wanna do is introduce our partner value proposition, or in other, in other words, um, our partner business proposition. Because clarity uh, into your partner value prop is how you ultimately create these indispensable relationships. And the partner business proposition is essentially the value the channel receives from selling your products and solutions. You know, forming a strong partner business proposition should be an essential element to any channel effort, whether it's recruitment or planning or program design. And the trick is to manage your partner value proposition to gain a competitive advantage. You know, your value provides the competitive filter a partner uses when determining you know, what vendor they will sell and support with their customers. And surprisingly, a large number of companies fail to develop a core competency in this area. You know, often they focus all their efforts developing a powerful customer value proposition and spend little time thinking about why a partner should sell their great product. And the result, of course, is slow or lack loss, lackluster adoption by the channel, you know, frustration within the company uh, and sluggish success in the marketplace. So before I move forward, um, you know, I wanted to get a sense from you know everyone on the call as to how well you think you understand your partner's uh, uh, partner value prop, your company's partner value prop. Excuse me. So we have a quick poll, and you know the question is, you know, how compelling is your messaging around why a partner should do business with you versus your competitor? You know, is it strong and you feel you've done an in-depth analysis and truly understand your unique value? you know, somewhat strong, where you generally know and have articulated why they do business with you. Um, not very, you know, where maybe you've talked about as a team, but don't have, you know, you know, specific messaging around it. And you know, finally, you don't know that you've never really thought about your, your partner value proposition. Okay, we'll give everyone a couple of seconds to um, pick one of those options and vote. So if everyone could um, please, um, select one of the options and vote. We'll give you another 10 or 15 seconds to do that. So if everyone could jump in and vote now, that will be absolutely brilliant. So we have most of the people on the call have voted. Uh, we have a few laggards. So um, if anyone hasn't voted yet, I'll give you another uh, 10 or 15 seconds um, to select your option, uh, and then we'll share the results um, with everyone on the call. Okay, okay. so um, let's show those results to everyone, and Dan, if you'd like to comment on those, that would be brilliant. Yeah, you know, the thesis is pretty interesting and it's about what we'd expect. You know, about a third of third of companies have done a pretty good job, you know, really articulating and understanding their partner value prop. You know, another, you know, third or so are down that path. And then another is that, you know, they're they may have thought about it, but you know, and probably understand that it's an important part of their business, but haven't really gone down that that path. So um, those are those are really interesting and I think you know, pretty, pretty telling results there. Okay. So let me, uh, let me move us on here. So from our perspective, you know, companies need to create value propositions, you know, based on three main elements. And the first is market momentum. The channel naturally migrates to products and services that are in high demand by their customers. And a company's market momentum is composed of customer demand, market share, and their leadership position. And next is relationships. 
you know, partners align to vendors when they see long-term value in that relationship. And partners assess alignment based on the vendor fit against their strategic initiatives, or excuse me, their strategic objectives, you know, the reputation either experienced or perceived, and, the, and the, they judge their satisfaction on their engagement with the vendor. And finally, it's partner economics. You know, partner economics is simply the financial return a partner can gain from a vendor relationship. You know, it factors in profits around a sale, but also, you know, factors in, you know, required investment costs and the benefits received through the relationship. Now, I'm going to go into each one of these individually and talk a little bit more about which, uh, what each of these elements looks like. So, from a momentum perspective, there are really three main drivers that you need to understand. You know, the first being market share. Market share refers to the to your understanding of your place in the market. You know, for instance, are you a market leader? Does your product own the market? Meaning there are few competing solutions or products. You know, then it's customer demand. And this is really focused on knowing whether there's buzz around your product. You know, has it been really hyped? You know, are customers asking for it? And this, of course, then you know influence how much selling partners need to do around your solution. And then finally, from a technology leadership perspective, you know, thinking about how innovative your product is. Is this a net new solution or perhaps just a better iteration of some other technology? You know, be gauging whether you are a leading technology in your particular category or field. And as you evaluate your solutions momentum, make sure to think about these three items. So now let's take a quick look at relationships. In our view, your partner relationships are really defined by these three items. You know, the first is business fit. When thinking about business fit, ask whether partners can keep their existing business model when doing business with you. You know, does your solution and selling requirements fit into their existing sales motions? If your model or the way that you're approaching the market differs drastically from your partners, you'll have a hard time getting partners to sell your product or solution. And now onto vendor reputation. You know, this focuses us on you as a vendor. Are you seen as being a good business partner for them? And this can be either experienced or perceived. You know, another thing to consider is whether you're competing directly with your partners. Are the rules of engagement clear and you have clear segmentation models across the different sales motions that are well understood, you know, in order to prevent conflict. And then finally, your relationships with partners will be influenced by their firsthand experience. You know, partners will be thinking about how easy you've been to do business with them in the past, you know, or things so cumbersome within your programs that partners are frustrated with all the hoops and, you know, therefore the partnership. You know, additionally, partners are going to be considering how good of a partner you've been to them in the past. And so while you may have made improvements to your programs and, you know, changes to your portals and whatever, you know, past uh, experiences are still going to influence your partners. You know, these things together really define the quality of your relationship with your partners. And now finally, let's take a look at partner economics. Partner economics comes down to three primary areas, partner profits, ongoing costs, and halo benefits. Partner profits is pretty self-explanatory, uh, self you know, but simply it's how much a partner can earn selling your solution. Can a partner, partner earn competitive margins? You know, how is the add-on business and the services opportunity? You know, are there incentives in place for the different sales outcomes? And, you know, next is, you know, ongoing costs of doing business with you. And these refer to things like the cost of onboarding, either as an organization or for you know, individual sellers. Are your certifications onerous and take significant time away from your sellers or the partner seller selling? Another consideration is the amount of overhead needed to, you know, partner, you know, and share information and maintain program status and do partner business planning, all those things. Finally, also be thinking about the partner halo benefits. Do your partners add on support and sales efforts uh, on addition to the selling? Does your solution offer unique selling opportunity into new accounts or segments? Does being a partner strengthen your partner's go to market ability or does it strengthen their marketability? So as you think about partner economics, Make sure that you don't focus singularly on the profit partner profitability piece, but keep the other elements in mind too. So now let's pull that all together. And when we look at all of the pieces combined, this is what we believe articulates and informs a vendor's true partner value proposition. And we believe it's hierarchical that 
the best partner value props and the things that partner looks for first and foremost are your company and solutions momentum in place in the market. You know, then it's followed by your relationships and experiences with you. And then finally economics. All of these are obviously very important, but this offers a bit of a prioritized list of what partners look for when they're looking at vendors. However, times, you know, they are a changing. Uh, what we've seen recently is that relationships are trumping all else. You know, Richard, who I mentioned again, is on the call, and he's a longtime channel leader, both within the industry and within Spur. And he and I both attend lots of channel events. You know, we consult and work on projects with many different vendor companies and, you know, talk with even more. And we talk a lot with uh, partners. And what we've seen in the last 18 months or so is a reprioritization from partners. You know, partners are now really looking at relationships as the key driver of the vendors that they choose to do business with. And this is trumping momentum and economics because it's really about their relationship with you as a vendor and what you have done for them and their experience with you that is solidifying a vendor in their eyes. And this is something that we hear time and time again, and it's a really important change. So, you know, we've, we've built this IP over a number of years and we've actually changed our, our, our partner value prop of, um, in recognition of this change. So, you know, with the understanding that relationships are paramount to your partner value proposition, it's crucial to think about how you position yourself across each one of these. And how you position yourself matters. Now, it's unusual for a company to have strengths in all areas, it just is. And almost all companies have soft spots within their value prop or within certain channel segments or within different partner sets, whatever it might be. So understanding your company's unique strengths and weaknesses is really important, but that alone is not enough. You must also understand your competitors' you know, business proposition. And a truly effective partner value proposition and the assessment of it, you know, benchmarks a company's business proposition relative to its key competitors within each targeted you know, partner segment. And by doing this, you can avoid costly missteps within your channel management efforts. So for instance, if you're recruiting solution providers that have poor alignment, your targeting and messaging is going to be ineffective and your efforts are unlikely to yield desired results. You know, if you have poor market momentum, then you either need to reposition your core offering in the marketplace or greatly enhance the economics and join alignment to offset your market position. You know, finally, for instance, if your channel economics are weak, but better than your competition, then running additional rebates or other margin programs may not add much to your business proposition, but it is going to cost you profit. So truly understanding your value proposition and fine tuning your competitive position is critical. And then conducting regular assessments will allow you to drive effectiveness within your channel efforts. And evaluating your value prop is more important now than ever before. You know, as I mentioned earlier, we've seen partner relationships take priority in recent months. And, and today it's more important to focus on this with your partners. The COVID-19 pandemic, you know, it's, it's upended everything. You know, business models are changing, selling motions are drastically different, and you as vendors and your partners are uncertain about what the future will hold. You know, but this is the time for you to separate yourself from other vendors in the minds of your partners as clearly, you know, we're not in a time of business as usual. It's really important for you to lean into solidifying your relationship with partners and make sure you focus on delivering in three key areas. You know, first, empower your field and telesale teams with information. You know, we've entered into a time where remote account management will become the norm. You know, we're likely never going to go back to a fully face-to-face -face account management structure. This means your people need to use the systems and tools to drive better knowledge of partners' needs and performance. Secondly, simplify your remote transactions with partners. You know, this is especially true around certifications and enablement. Open all that up. You know, your partners are, are likely shifting into learn mode. You know, they're probably using the slowing down of the business and the people's work at home time to get trained and learn new technology. You know, facilitate this by making it available for free and in a convenient manner. You know, think of it as an investment on building out all that added capability you've been desiring over the last several years. You know, one of the things that we've seen um, partners or vendors doing, and you know, a storage vendor in particular, uh, they're creating guides for partners to make it as simple as possible to help customers leverage their solutions. And then focus on partner activation. 
you know, you, you should have structured onboarding and activation as part of your partner recruitment efforts, you know, but these structured efforts, you know, typically end after either a set period of time or a certain business clip level is reached. And so you need to be rethinking this for two reasons. First, your partners are likely to be distracted right now and not generally thinking about you. So you need to help your partners keep their focus and proactively assess who is maintaining the right set of actions. And even identifying those partners whose models and solutions are thriving during these turbulent times. As an example, for instance, you know, NetApp is extending eligibility for achievement in their partner growth programs in order to keep partners active and engaged during this time. The second thing you need to do is um, you know, create a structured cadence with your account, man account managers to meet with partners and drive you know, simple activities and measure performance impact right now. Partners are going to remember which vendors helped them through this time and which ones did not. And their experience you know, will define which vendors they favor for the next several years at least. So what can you do to make these broad steps happen? And, and be forewarned, you know, this is gonna be a pretty meaty and, and heavy slide. So uh, the first thing you can do is focus on the partnership, focus on the partner experience. And you know, what I mean by that is you know, train your partner account reps on the new expectations. You know, they should be you know, meeting with their assigned partners virtually at least once per week. And at least the first half of that time should focus on how the partner is doing and how you can help and then spend the back half of the call inventorying a specific set of activities or, or whatever the things that you want accomplished in the next week or so. Secondly, be magnanimous with your program requirements. If your program has annual certification or training requirements, you know, extend the expiry date of the training. You know, this is something, again, that NetApp has recently done. They extended the certification requirements by six months. And that's really smart. You know, allow partner account managers to roll back any revenue requirements for partners that they deem as engaged. You know, extend the valid time of deal registration by 90 days or whatever is reasonable. And if your program requires annual renewal, you know, um, grace people at their current program level for a quarter or so. And then third, increase your partner communications around best practices. You know, most of your partners are scared for the economic impacts of their business. And their first priority is remaining financially healthy. You know, their second priority is keeping their people sane, productive, and happy. And their third priority is maintaining and building, you know, their relationships with their customers. You know, their relationship with you as a vendor is, you know, fourth or fifth on their priority list. But use your visibility of what different partners are doing to spread the word on best practices. And this is how you can help them keep their business healthy and not necessarily focusing on yours. You know, this also means being more available in the front line with your partners when it comes to managing customer challenges. The next thing you can do is double down on the partnership part of partnering. So while the first three items I talked about help reinforce your partner's experience, you must also demonstrate your strength as a partner. And this means you must be recognized that this is a time to invest and not cut back on your partner support. So for example, increase your contra revenue spend your partners are worried about burning through cash right now and doubling down on your contra programs and powering your partner account managers to get creative and make additional funds available. You know, and keep those funds, of course, tied to business plans and measurable outcomes, but that is going to be very visible, you know, uh, to your partners and that willingness is going to hopefully drive incremental business. You know, take a look at what Dell did announce or what Dell announced a couple of days ago, you know, allowing businesses to purchase a variety of products and services, including to and through partners with no interest in deferred payment terms. You know, again, really smart moves. Secondly, you know, make any services available to broadly and for free. For instance, marketing concierge services. You know, raise your partner's ability to leverage your infrastructure, develop and sponsor special marketing campaigns and activities that focus around managing customer outreach and support. You know, don't relax reporting requirements necessarily, but do relax performance requirements. And then thirdly, you know, remove the gates around your protected content. Temporarily, temporarily remove the barriers to your portal for partners. You know, you know, this may pose some competitive risk, you know, but it's outweighed by the commitment that signifies to your partners. You know, the worst case scenario, is no one takes advantage of the lower thresholds. You know, the likely case though, is you have a bunch of new partners who use your learning and use your content. And if it's good, 
you know, derive value in such a manner that they're going to want to continue leveraging it after the re relaxed restrictions end. You know, for example, you know, Hitachi Ventara, you know, they're offering their customers and partners free access to their entire learning library until the end of July. You know, again, a really smart move, that, you know, designed to help, um, you know, show their commitment and partnership. So the first two sets of activities, you know, show your focus on the partner and your willingness to invest in the partnership. But you must round it out by concentrating on your internal channel efforts. And let me explain what I mean by that. So, you know, the first thing you need to do is make sure you know everything you can about your partner's business. You know, how is their business trending? You know, where has the, in, the pandemic impacted their business? What universal trends are you seeing and how are other partners dealing with similar situations? Your ability to report out and share this information is paramount, and it's also a differentiator. Not only will most vendors not do this, they probably can't do this. It means their reps are going into situations cold and their programs aren't flexing as needed and they can't plan accordingly. You also need to focus on having and leveraging data. You know, we've focused almost entirely on your partners so far, but there's likely a level of anxiety within your company too. You know, your leadership is likely reevaluating almost every process in the wake of the pandemic. And they want to know where are the impacted areas, you know, how much risk is presently in the business, and what are the best forms of mitigation. You know, pressure is going to increase for your channel teams to show value and return during this time. And having data, and you know, this is something that Richard and I have been talking about for years, is essential to quantifying all of this. It's going to show you where to focus and what to do and whether or not uh, things are working. And finally, you know, use this opportunity to bring capabilities in-house with your team. You know, it's likely that you currently have strong dependency on others. So IT, finance, operation, you know, for your data and for your reporting. And as their resources get strained and diverted, your ability to be responsive and agile likely diminishes. So build your case around this fact right now. Lobby hard with your leadership the pain and the risk this poses to the business and seek their commitment to prevent this in the future by bringing these capabilities into your channel organization. You know, make sure that you have the platform, the team in-house to support data-driven channel management, and this will pay dividends long after the pandemic. You know, and this brings us though to a stark truth. You know, doing all of this at scale and leveraging a digital touch in this time and using technology as an enabler you know, requires the right technology. So with that in mind, let me hand things over to Carrie. And if you're unfamiliar with Impartner, you know, it's arguably one of the leading providers of partner management technology. So with that, Carrie, take it away. Thank you so much, Dan. Could not agree more with everything that you just said. Absolutely. All right, uh, let's go. Uh, um, to echo what Dan just said, in Partner, we're a leading provider of um, partner relationship management solutions, and we're lucky to, enough to work with leading corporations and channel chiefs uh, worldwide. And time and time and time again, the most successful companies follow the recipe that Dan just emphasized, uh, focusing on the partner experience, doubling down on the partnership part of partnering and concentrating on channel efforts to better understand their, their partner's businesses. But um, it is a different time. It absolutely is a different time. And uh, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. Uh, it is in these unprecedented times. We, we've never seen this before. Anything that anyone is experiencing anywhere, it's new and everyone, and I mean everyone, is just trying to figure it out. Uh, Dan mentioned a few scenarios that they're seeing with their clients. Uh, I'll tell you, we, we haven't seen hard pivots like we're seeing before. Uh, consider one of our uh, major corporations uh, that's a customer of ours uh, in the past 20 days, uh, they've added and onboarded over 2,500 new partners. Uh, their partner portal logins have increased 50%. Uh, and there are all sorts of these kinds of shifts that we see uh, throughout our customer base uh, that are requiring people to figure out how to nimbly change and meet that demand. Uh, we see a software company that normally is blocking sales and marketing data shifting because people are using it to figure out who's going to get COVID-19. We have giant 
conference calling companies and web camera companies uh, scrambling to figure out how to meet all that consumer demand and work through their partners to deliver on that instead of to uh, through B2B commercial audiences. We have a host of material handling companies that all of a sudden their packaging is not going through a commercial route. It's going through a commercial route to, to help ship to all of us who are homebound. I'm like Dan, I'm 30 miles away from him broadcasting from Seattle uh, in the forest. Um, and we have a host of cybersecurity companies that are, are, are racing to protect the IP from uh, uh, while all of their employees are, are working from home. And, and the simple truth of it is that without automation, you're simply not going to be able to scale and to pivot and to capture the revenue that we are all desperate to keep in these challenging market conditions uh, and really have time for the strategic conversations that Dan and Spur is talking about if you don't have the automation you need to take care of those operational basics uh, and really be able to focus on the partners, the, uh, the partner experiences that and conversations that you you need to have to really truly drive value uh, and, it, and it's not going to get any easier i mean look at the headlines i'm sure every single one of us uh is uh tightening our belts already uh if not staff um and and you simply won't be able to do it uh without automation um uh you you need you need time oops uh you need time to be able to uh to have those strategic conversations i think we'll uh, go to a poll now yeah kayla uh, so if we could bring that up, uh, how many of you out there, how many of you now uh, have the time uh, to have the truly strategic conversations with your partners uh, that you need to drive your mutual businesses? Yes, no, or okay, no but, way. Uh, everyone could, could now vote. Just bring everyone in and... Uh... We'll give everyone a few seconds. Okay, keep keep going, folks. We've got a few people that still haven't voted, so if you could um, keep it open for another 10 or 15 seconds, and then we'll close it down and share the results with everyone. So if you haven't voted, Last chance to vote. I think we're showing up at uh, pretty much somewhat, right? But not quite there. Like, you know, okay, Caleb. Yeah. You want to share, just let uh, Caleb share the results with everyone, Kerry, and then if you could talk us through those results, that'd be brilliant. Okay. okay. Yeah, it looks like, you know, it looks like 30% uh, of you are doing okay, but, um, you know, about 60% of you say, say somewhat. Um, and uh, I think we all know that that somewhat really isn't isn't good enough in this market to really be able to help people figure out uh, and spend time figuring out where to pivot. But there's good news here. There's good news here. Um, and that's that. Um, let's see. That's that automation gives you the time that you need to really have the personal touch. Uh, when you automate your operational basics, you really have the time to need uh, you need to have the conversations um, that you want to have with your partners. So meet your new employee uh, in partner relationship management. I'll, I'll be talking about uh, that's a core uh, channel automation platform. I'll focus on that today for the for the sake of the discussion. Forrester will tell you that for every in one dollar that you invest in a technology like PRM, uh, it saves you $10 in labor. Um, our own data, um, I'll share a lot of data points that come from our own studies of our global customer base. Uh, the results are always anonymized back to us. We don't know who is saying what, and uh, we want it that way because we don't want anybody to be nice to us. We, we want to know the hard facts. So um, when you think about automation and you think about um, prioritizing spend and you think about how you're going to get through uh, running your uh, business uh, without additional staff and uh, uh, be able to really scale and pivot and meet what you're seeing out there, um, the, the power of automation um, statistically is really key. So let me spend time and, and dig into that and say, well, well, how? Well, in what ways? 
we, we could talk all day. Um, I'll highlight uh, seven ways that automation really uh, lets you uh, go after those operational basics and have time uh, for those human touches that you really want to have. So let's let's start with recruiting and onboarding. Uh, you saw an example I shared a moment ago that uh, about one of our customers who signed on 2,500 partners within the last 20 days. If there is any kind of handcrafted Etsy type human touch process in your channel ecosystem, there's no way you can meet that demand. There is no way that you will be able to capture that much needed market opportunity and that much needed revenue unless you can automate this process and get your contract signed and get your partners up and ready to go. Uh, um, you need a... Uh, and PRM solutions, you know, they really, they give you the the uh, customer experience that you need right from the get-go. Uh, so they know they're gonna have a world-class uh, partner experience and that you're really gonna be able to put in front of them an automated way, the content and the next steps they need uh, to, to get up and running and effectively uh, delivering on what the market needs. Uh, our studies show an average uh, increase of about 45% uh, in uh, customers' ability to recruit and train new partners when they automate recruiting and onboarding. Training enablement. Uh, there's a simple reason that direct sales teams generally outpace indirect sales teams, and, and that's because they have better access to better training materials and they're able to uh, hit the ground running. Uh, take these security companies that we were talking about a minute ago. Uh, right now, uh, they're uh, as much as there's heat in the industry, there is there's also competition. So if you want new partners uh, to be up and running, or you want your existing partners to be up and running uh, and bringing technologies to life in new way, new ways with uh, with your stakeholders, uh, they need training and they need it fast. Uh, you you simply can't do that. Dan or Dan talked about uh, really enabling your training and um, bringing your partners to life on the ground uh, when you can't be there. Uh, our studies show uh, a 35% increase in channel revenue due to better trained partners. So enable those partners out there now. You need them more than ever. Deal registration. Oh boy, uh, do we not have enough channel co or conflict in the world right now? Uh, last thing we need is, is channel conflict. Click, click on uh, any, any news story, any media outlet. Uh, and uh, look at the deals that are going through right now. This is monster deals of uh, to companies who are are trying to enable our entire call centers and entire customer uh, service centers to have their employees work at home. You 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 all know what it takes to bid on a deal like that. And the last thing you want is a competitor of theirs swooping in and stealing that deal. You will never get another chance to win that partner's loyalty back. You will lose their loyalty forever. You need a powerful deal registration uh, system. <clears throat> and, th and that's challenging in the best of times, and it's worse in the worst of times when deals like that are, are stolen away from your partners. So don't let that happen. Uh, contemporary solutions um, uh, like a PRM, they, they, help you, they help your partners protect that business. It helps you win the loyalty. Uh, our data shows an 80% reduction in channel conflict when you provide the right solutions for your partners to register those deals. Ah, performance tracking, ah, it's all about the numbers. You don't, nobody out there runs their direct sales force uh, without looking at the numbers all the time. I, I, don't, I don't think you could point to a CRO out there right now who isn't wringing their hands uh, in, in, in with worry, uh, looking at what deals are moving ahead and what deals are being slowed by COVID and what deals are being frozen because funding is being cut. And you need that same visibility with your partners. Uh, your CAMs need an efficient, automated way a non-spreadsheet way uh, to see which partners are, are driving the most revenue, uh, which partners are having success in um, some unexpected ways by this market. Uh, Rod was talking earlier how he was uh, trying to order hair clippers and he can't get them for 
uh, you know, tell May. Uh, I, I may look my like, uh, Rapunzel before the the, the end of this uh, uh, this quarantine experience. So there are, there are all sorts of market opportunities are changing. So you need to see what you need to help your partners uh, shift. You need to see who's what's who's benefiting from it, um, and you need to see, uh, be able to reward uh, the behaviors uh, by showing them the next level benefits and how to get there. Uh, studies will show you that um, partners aren't impressed when you don't have that information. Uh, there's a, a recent CompTIA study uh, that says 61% so of, of partners find that vendors have insufficient reporting on approvals and, and, and uh, payout status. So uh, don't let that be you. Know who's performing. Be able to recognize your partners. Be able to pivot where they're seeing success. Uh, contemporary solutions, PRM solutions, that's a, a built-in capability. Uh, our, our data shows uh, a 50% increase in CAM's ability uh, to be able to meet their quota and a 25% increase in the number of them partners uh, improving their port performance. So uh, in these times, you need that insight. Marketing and communications. Uh, everybody's stretched. You're stretched, I'm stretched, uh, we're all stretched. Uh, and, and most of your partners out there, uh, you know they're small. They they don't have sophisticated marketing tools. Uh, and and to echo again what we said a little bit earlier, when you can't be on the ground now, you need your partners to be able to deliver on that last marketing mile um, now more than ever before. And you need to give them the tools to be able to do it uh, and do it effectively. And we talked about all these changes. Uh, again, the software company that all of a sudden it's um, selling to people who are trying to 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 grok who's going to get COVID. Uh, that's a shift in what your partners need. You need to be able to communicate with them. Uh, you need to go out on the fly in format, in language to the right people uh, and, and in minutes and efficiently. Uh, we've seen uh, customers of ours uh, send out over a, a, a million newsletters um, in, in the last few weeks um, addressing all those changes and making sure that their partners are really ready to, to shift, to pivot, to be trained, to, to know what to do, to have product information that's new um, and be able to take <clears throat> advantage of that. Uh, and uh, contemporary automation tools, uh, you can reduce your the time that it takes to do that and the efficiency of your team, which again is getting leaner and leaner and tighter and tighter uh, by up to 50%. Engagement, um, you know, uh, if there's a, a word that uh, it may be the most overused word these days uh, next to uh, unprecedented, uh, but it's it's critical. Uh, your, your partner portal is your digital front door. Uh, if you have a dated, dirty, threadbare front doormat of a, of a partner portal, uh, you know, without a single sign on, and, and, and maybe there's a need for your partners to sign into uh, multiple technology to solutions to to get what they need. Uh, it's it's a clue that that you're going to be they're going to be facing a, a dated, hard to use, friction filled experience ahead of them. Uh, you you everybody's hungry in that market. Your your partners want what you have to sell, but you know if you're in a market where you've got a lot of competitors differentiated by a few speeds and feeds, uh, they're going to go to the next guy that's easier to do business with. Uh, they will leave you in a flash. Uh, there's a, a recent study from uh, iPad channel channel uh, channel companies research arm, uh, and they say that 86% of of your partners uh, judge whether they want to do business with you uh, on your partner portal. So uh, uh, you need to be fast and nimble in this market. You need to automate in this market, and you need to create an experience that's going to make it easy, quick, and fast for them to do business with you. Um, we, uh, our, our data shows a 41% increase in partner engagement in the first year of use alone. So make it easy for your partners, automate your partner's journey, um, and you're gonna stand ahead of your competition. Number seven, um, the shadow channel. You hear a lot about that in the marketplace. Um, and right now, uh, uh, those partners are even more important. We all know that the business unit buyer, not IT, is the primary buyer now of today's technology. And those business unit buyers, they turn to their accountants and their legal firms and their consultants to say, what do I do? Uh, where do I turn? They're already at the front door of the customer's pain uh, and uh, they are already uh, 
trusted advisors, and they are becoming more and more important. They have stepped out of the shadows and into the limelight as a key referral partner channel for you. Don't miss out on that opportunity. Don't miss on those referral partners who uh, are, are looking or on those referral partners that can drive your business um, and your business unit buyers are turning to. Um, but that's that's a hard thing to do. A lot of people think, well, you know, there's no way I can automate automate managing that seemingly unmanageable group of partners, but you can. There's technology out there to automate that and let you get on top of it and take advantage of it. Uh, our data shows that you can see as much of a 30% increase uh, in the revenue that you drive from your referral partners if you really have the right solutions out there to make it manageable for you. So I could talk all day. There are so many things that you can do and so many technologies you could turn to, but now is the time to automate. Um, make more of yourself, make more of you. So I'm gonna do a, a, a quick summary uh, with uh, some key points from that, and then uh, we'll open it back up uh, with, uh, for a Q&A with Dan. So uh, let me stress, now is the time to focus on uh, developing a, a compelling partner business proposition. You need the best partners now more than ever to survive in this market. The criticality of your relationship partners has redlined. Uh, you need partners to extend your business and to extend your reach. If you're like most companies, 75% of your revenue goes through the channel. Make sure you invest in this capillary system that's essential uh, to your business. The third, uh, the fourth thing, uh, the personal human touch is key with partners, but make sure you have the automation you need to give you time to do that. And lastly, channel management technologies like uh, PRM, they're the technology that world leaders are turning to, to ex efficiently extend their teams and accelerate the performance of their channel. So with that, thank you. And uh, Dan and Richard, let's take some questions. Hey, I've got a number of questions coming in. If anybody's got um, questions they want to add, um, feel free, as I said, um, you can either raise your hand or uh, you can type the questions in. So let's keep those questions coming. Um, the first question I have, um, and maybe um, Dan, if you could take a look at this one. Um, it's a question from um, someone on the call. And the question is, um, even if we have time, to talk to our partners. Have you got any tips to actually get client mind share so you really can get um, time for those very important discussions? Yeah, you know, and when I think I think the question is when you say client mind share, it's you know customer mind share, you know ultimate customer line, uh, mind share, and. You know, there's no real tricks there. I mean, your 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 momentum in the market is what it is. Now, there are things you can do to accelerate that. You know, there's go-to-marketing strategies that you have. But what you need to do is look at your partner value prop end to end, and again, really figure out where you have strengths and where you have weaknesses. And you want to focus on your strengths and highlight your strengths as differentiators, and you know, and and not necessarily then highlight where you have you know, soft spot or weaknesses in your value prop. So, you know, while you do want to try to, you know, address and change your position in the market, you know, that's a longer term play than immediately highlighting where you have, you know, current strengths and and making that the core element of your, you know, two partner value proposition. Yeah, if I might add just one one more thing to to that. I think that you you also want to make sure that you are really focusing on them a little bit more than you're focusing on you. Too often the partner account managers or whatever you call them, you know, it's where are you with pipeline or what are you doing with this new opportunity? And that's the first part of the conversation. And I think it ties a lot into what Carrie was saying with, with what a partner provides. That gives you insight into what are their business challenges. And so yeah. then you can have a start with a conversation on the partners. And then that leads into a stronger relationship and an opportunity for them to meet and to have, have deeper discussions with you. Excellent. And I have another question um, coming in. 
um, and that's very much to do with the pandemic we're facing today. Um, what are the trends in what partners are asking for in the face of this pandemic? What's actually changed? What are the things they're asking for from the vendors that they haven't asked for previously, or perhaps not as frequently? I will tell you, uh, Rod, that uh, when we look at uh, what our customers are, are saying that uh, is being demanded of them, it's, it's collateral and training. Um, with some of those shifts that I was talking about of um, all of a sudden maybe a product that wasn't so hot or a product that has a different use, uh, customers really are scrambling to get the information they need to be able to go and capture that market momentum. Yeah, I, I'd echo that. I think that that is right. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, partners are, you know, using this this time and, you know, potential downturn in their business to, you know, do training and get certifications. And so as a vendor, if you open all those gates up and you make that available, you know, that's ultimately going to pay dividends for, for a vendor too. It's not only, you know, showing your investment in your partner community, but it's also simultaneously up-leveling the capability of your partners. So it has long-term returns if you, you know, start removing those gates for content, for marketing services, for certifications. Um, you know, if you if you think about extending, you know, the the, the renewals and, this, and, and your cert links and things of that nature, again, it's showing the investment in the partners and allows them to then focus on their business, not on maintaining the relationship with you. Okay, I've got another great question coming in, and that is um, because of the pandemic, it's proving um, difficult to get the partners' mind share. Um, are you seeing any, have you got examples you've seen of specific marketing campaigns or messaging um, from vendors that are really resonating with partners today? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. I think that. I, I can answer it two ways. One thing that I think that we see that isn't working is the, and I think that everyone on this call has probably received plenty of these emails, is the, you know, I'm here for you email, you know, and you know, we're here to support you in this time, et cetera. But, you know, that is ultimately meaningless. And, you know, what, what, what you need to do as a vendor is, you know, again, all the things that we've talked about and what Carrie talked about is show your commitment either financially or with content. And those are the sort of things that I think, you know, is working and that is is resonating within the market. You know, I mentioned some things that NetApp done, and you know, they they had a series of five or six things that were just really, really smart that they posted as far as, you know, keeping engagement with their with their partners through this time and you know, helping their partners deal with frontline issues and challenges and helping, you know, removing the gates to ops, uh, to the content and extending the expiry of their certifications. So, you know, again, the the, the goal for them is to continue um, driving, you know, active engagement with their partners. Okay. You guys and I have another. Oh, no, I just, I would just echo it, Dan. I, you know, there was, uh, of course, an, an entire wave that went out of, you know, we're here for you and we're going to be stable and all of those things. And um, yeah, now people are like, okay, I'm afraid my business is in trouble. Um, and who knows when this is going to end and give me constructive ways where there is market demand that I can go and make sure I feed my family. And I think, that, I think that that is really important. I mean, you know, most partners are smaller businesses. You know, there are obviously some very large partners out there, but the majority of partners are not. And, you know, they're seeing that their revenues are shrinking and that their costs are almost always labor. Um, you know, so they have to pay people you know, when, when, they're, when their um, customers are drying up. And so anything that you can do as a vendor to kind of either help them, um, you know, better utilize their resources, refocus them into areas that don't appear to be hard hit. Um, you know, we've all seen some solutions are actually taking off during this time as opposed to, um, um, you know, being, being uh, limited. And so, you know, to the degree that you can focus them, share the best practices, show what's working with your other sets of partners, how they're positioning themselves in the market, that's the type of thing that they're really looking for because they see that vendors are a more resourceful group of people that can really share uh, knowledge, programs, infrastructure that, that they wouldn't be able to tap into. 
Yeah, and, and Richard, you mentioned like the cash flow is a big issue, and so you know some of these financing things that that, that Dell and Cisco and others are doing, where they're either delaying, you know, finance or creating finance terms or deferring payment for 90 days, you know, that's going to help the small partners get through some of this this crunch as they start you know, pushing out, you know, software and, and hardware. Yeah, and even even potentially. You know, as a as a as a vendor, maybe changing your net terms with your customers, you know, mm -hmm. because that's going to make your solution look more interesting to your customers, which is going to be beneficial to your partners. So, you know, that's a great example of how you can do something as a vendor. Okay, excellent. And we're almost out of time, so let let me finish with a lovely crystal ball gazing question for all of you. Um, it's just come in. What is going to be the biggest long-term impact we might see as a result of the pandemic when it comes to our partnerships? So who wants to step in first on that one? I'm happy to. You know, I think what we're going to see is, um, you know, the remote selling and services of customers and also partners, you know, that's, that's going to be here to stay. Um, so I think that whole model has shifted. And while the technology has you know, been enabled and has been around for a while to enable this, you know, I think that what we've seen is, is these relationships and the account management structures has been hindered by you know, old habits. And so with everyone now living this differentiated lifestyle of working remote and having to do everything remote and virtually, you know, those old habits are probably breaking. And so we're probably gonna see a new way of, of doing business when it comes to you know, customer and partner account management. And it's likely going to be remote and virtual driven. Kerry, do you want to step in on that one? Yeah, you know, it, it's funny. Like we we do this webinar because, you know, it's timed around this scenario that we all find ourselves in. Uh, but I think the topic uh, really stands. Uh, you know, there's so many things that you can do and so many ways that you can invest money. Um, and so many people are always on the cusp of just putting in that automation. Um, uh, but it really is true that, you know, automation uh, really does uh, take away those repetitive administrative tasks that don't add any value to your partners. And by doing that, then you can really focus on the conversation you want to have anyway. So uh, we, we see so many companies like, you know, in our pipeline saying, oh, my gosh, I need that efficiency, but I do think it causes, it, it is absolutely going to uh, tip it and cause a next wave of automation because people will be forced to get on board because there's no other way to do it. And I think it'll it'll stick because people see that they can do more of the human touch and, and what Spur is recommending when they don't have to mess around with admin. Yeah, yeah. I've got two, I, I, can't, I can't limit myself to one. So I've got, I've got two, um, I think, that partners are going to remember which vendors were there for them. You know, this is a very personal moment for most of them where they see that their business is at jeopardy. And those vendors that invest with them and help support them and are there for them in the crisis, that is going to take, um, they're going to remember that for years as opposed to just the, 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 the people who just continue to do business like it was normal. So I think that, I think that that's important. I think that the second thing um, is that as a vendor, um, this is like all of the big changes that have happened when people were moving to the cloud and, and you know, everything else. Um, it's gonna shake up who are your best partners. Some of your mm -hmm. largest partners are gonna go out of business and some of your smaller partners or people that aren't on your radar are either going to be in the right place at the right time with the right solutions that it doesn't impact them. And so your ability to manage that, keep your eye on that, understand what's going on with that is going to be critical or you're going to be spending a lot of your time and effort on partners um, that aren't going to be there to allow you to see the dividends of your investments. Excellent. Really good finish there, Richard. So Kerry, Dan, Richard, Thank you for a fabulous webinar. Um, this will be posted online, so it'll be available to everyone. Um, and if you have any other questions, um, there'll also be a place where you can post um, any additional questions. If we haven't got round to your questions, and there are a couple of those, um, basically um, the answers to those questions will also be posted online. But once again, um, Kerry, Dan, Richard, 
thank you very, very much indeed. Really, really appreciate it. Great job, guys. Thank Great. you, Rod. Thank, thank you, you, Channel Focus. Thank you, thank you back to your group.